All right, everyone. Uh, I think I'm going to get started with my talk now. Um, I'm glad to be here today at JSConf and to be a follow-up act to the beer. Um, I want to first uh, dispel some misinformation or uh, some ignorance that was put out a moment ago by the previous speaker. He had a moment ago up a picture of a policeman riding a Tyrannosaurus shooting some aliens on the moon. And he said he didn't know where the picture came from. Uh, I'd like to inform you that, that picture comes from, uh, not from Google Closure, uh, from the stellar Axe Cop comic. And I know this because I recently won a costume contest. <laughs> that is the uh, subtly nuanced character, uh, Abraham Lincoln, explosion god. Um, so with that out of the way, maybe I can get to my talk a little more comfortably. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is John Davidson. I work with Cloudkick, which was recently acquired by Rackspace. And we do... Um, a lot of work with servers, as you might imagine. Rackspace does hosting. Cloudkick does server monitoring. And this uh, meant that for our user interfaces for our web app, we found need to be displaying information that couldn't be readily conveyed with traditional widgets that would come kind of baked in with uh, the user interface libraries um, that are popular. And this includes uh, the Google Closure Library. Google Closure Library comes with your stock set of widgets, but those were also not what we needed, you know, buttons, um, sliders, things like that. That's not what we needed to show things like uh, CPU usage, um, complex information in a tree regarding the check on a system. So it pushed us to develop a lot of our own widgets. And we found that the Google Closure Library was valuable not for the widgets it contained, but because it exposes the framework that Google uses to create its widgets. And we followed suit and used that framework to make some of our own. So to step back a moment, um, what are the Google Closure tools? The library is just the first piece of them. You also have the Google Closure compiler, the Google Closure templates, and the Closure linter. I'm going to be talking primarily about the library and writing a little bit of code in the library to show you what it looks like. Um, but I find that a lot of developers haven't taken on um, any programming projects with the Closure Library because there's definitely a lot to it and it can be kind of daunting. Um, let's see. And so to reference some of the things that we're doing um, at CloudKick, we do make use of the library, the compiler, the templates. But we buck the trend, and we don't need the Google Closure uh, linter, because we've got JS lint, and you can deal with it. OK, um, so what do I mean when I'm talking about uh, some custom widgets? Uh, I'm going to bring up one of them here and show why it's not something that's conventional enough to be found in a regular um, library. If I can remember the hotkeys. Oops. Ah, oh, there we go. This is one that I wrote, and um, its function isn't readily apparent when you look at it right here, but if you um, see it on our page, it makes a little more sense. What you have around here are um, the places where you'd have some check on your system. You, this, instead of being D, would be SSH. C would be ping. You could have memory. You could have any custom checks that you've set up on your own system that could run on your side and then report back to us. Um, this widget is ignorant of all that meaning, and it's just about displaying what you have. So maybe you've got some kind of aggregates of those data. Um, you wanted to select one of the subgroups of it. Um, I won't dwell on it, but you can see that it's something unconventional as the kind of thing where you'd like to be able to define the behavior exactly on your own terms and not have to settle for something else. Um, OK. So before I start on that, um, I'm going to ha introduce you to the parent for the classes that I'm going to create, which is the Google UI component. Uh, the Google UI component, uh, it inherits from its grandparent, the disposable, which imbues it with some properties that give it a life cycle, where you enter into um, the memory. Subsequently, you can enter into the DOM itself, exiting the DOM, maybe to return, maybe not, and then be disposed. Um, there's an event framework that gets put in with goog.events.eventTarget. And then um, finally, there's the Goog UI component that works in a lot of the helper functions that you'll find in the widgets, um, in the widgets themselves. All right. 
So widget lifecycle, this is a pretty important concept and what made uh, this framework pretty valuable to us. The image on the right demonstrates the paths that a widget can take in its lifecycle. We're only going to be focusing on one of them, but I'm going to introduce them here just because um, it's uh, an important concept to understand. Um, if you start from the instantiated widget over there, you have the render path, the decorate path, and the dispose path. The render path is one where you would say, I have a target where I want to place this widget, and it will, um, let me see if I can gesture this. It'll execute create DOM and enter document on its own. And that means it's going to create its own DOM. Um, it's going to do the functions that you've defined in enter document to enter the document. And um, at that point, it's displayed. The user's looking at it. The user can interact with it. The user can see it. Um, the similar path that's not as um, useful to us is decorate. If that DOM element already existed, you could take um, your widget and just attach all of its events and handlers to the existing DOM element. But because our apps are usually HTML um, generated by JavaScript, we don't find ourselves as frequently needing some other part of our JavaScript to be creating the widgets. It makes more sense for us to just encapsulate that inside um, the Goog UI component itself and use the render path. Uh, dispose over here is just if you were to create a widget and say it was supposed to be ready for some view that popped in, but the user never used it. So you just dispose of it when you're done. And over here we have some of the functions that I'm going to be explaining to you momentarily when I walk through um, the creation of a widget itself. So this is the simplified widget lifecycle um, to get rid of the other paths. This is the one that we're going to be taking for the demo in a moment. We're going to be instantiating, um, rendering, and disposing are the functions that we're going to be calling. And in the background, it's going to hit create DOM, enter document, and then when you dispose, it's going to hit exit document and dispose internal. OK. So I thought the widget that I work on today um, is something that you see on sites like eBay or a lot of sales sites. I think Woot has something similar. Uh, it's this little countdown, um, I would call this a pretty simple widget, where it's um, displaying some number of seconds, and it's updating itself, and it's telling you that you better buy something fast because time's running out. Um, so before I do that, I have to show a little bit about how the class system works in Google Clojure. Um, the two important ones to know straight off the bat are Goog Provide and Goog Require. Goog Provide is how when you make a file, you say, this is what I'm providing in this file. If other files are wanting to require it, this is the namespace it should be addressed by. Um, and Goog Require is how you request that file. So for example, um, the opening for the event target object that I talked about earlier opens with Goog Provide, um, and then it gives out in string what its name is. Um, Goog require, and it takes the two things that then get incorporated um, in during the file. Um, what we're going to be doing here is kind of a bad example, but because we're doing a bad example, I'm going to put the warning in. Um, when you use Goog require, the way it includes the code is by taking uh, what you've asked for and generating a script tag that's appropriate. So if you wanted to use Goog UI button, as we do here, you would have to use, um, you'd have to have the require statement in a separate set of tags to make sure that its um, inserted script tag gets executed before you get to the next block. If we were to combine those two, we would get an error that says that Goog UI button doesn't exist yet. OK. Um, that is, there we go. So let me bring up the stub of what we're going to be working with. I've cheated a little bit in that I have um, already created the file that we're going to be using. And I can't spell, evidently, courtesy of the beer. Um, OK. Um, so I've stubbed this out in the functions that we're interested in. And I've put the to do's in each place where we're going to have to be implementing it ourselves. Um, the first thing, we would, I don't know if I'm going to go through all of these um, all the way in the interest of time, but I can go through a few of the obvious ones. Um, let's see here. I'm going to angle this a bit so I can see better. So right there we have that we need to add our Goog provide and Goog require statements. Simple enough, we're going to um, 
require the component. Uh, actually, this is moving significantly slower than I thought it would. We've got timers, another one that we would want. Um, and goog.events, because we're going to be doing a little bit of event handling. And I will start to put it in the goog provide. We're just going to call this one countdown, which is later what we refer to this class as, which is the countdown. And actually, in the interest of time, I feel like this is a cooking show all of a sudden, but I have something that I baked earlier. Um, is that visible? No, excellent, okay. Visible-ish now? How are we doing? We're going to work that for a second. Um, so let me show you how I filled this out on my own earlier. Um, I decided that we wanted to pass in in the constructor here, the first part. We need to know the time remaining. Um, we need to have a timer. And we need to start that timer. We're listening for ticks on the timer. And every time we have a tick, we're going to handle the tick, which is just going to decrement um, the time that we have remaining the appropriate amount for what the um, interval is set to. I think presently the interval is set to one second. And um, at that point, we refresh the content, which just sets the number of seconds into the uh, element itself. And those are the kind of inner working parts. But let me show you how I've filled out the um, behind the scenes stuff, the create DOM, uh, et cetera. So enter document. All we had to do here, um, we took advantage of the, event, the uh, event handler that comes built in. And the advantage of using the event handler that comes built in with this widget, as opposed to using our own um, listen calls, is that the uh, event handler that comes with the widget is coterminous with the widget. So anytime we set a bunch of listeners on this, when we finally go to dispose, or we go to exit document actually, it's going to remove those listeners automatically. So I think I had it just like console logging because I wanted to set something here. I couldn't really think of anything to put in. Um, dispose internal, um, because everything else was already handled for us in the superclasses dispose internal, the only thing I really needed to get rid of was that timer that I created initially. Um, and let me see if I have it in here. I think I, oh, that's right. Um, I was going to put an exit document uh, statement as well. But it turns out that because things were handled for me, I didn't even need to author one. So as you can see, it's a pretty simple function. But it's pretty simple to um, get it to fit into the framework of Google Closure itself. And evidently, I changed something. So let me open that demo we have a moment. First, I have to um, correct some JavaScript a moment. Oh, and you'll see that I included cheat up there. Um, what cheat does is it Goog requires the um, component beforehand, because like I said, you need to have that required earlier for the way that this is working at the moment. Um, because this isn't bundled together. If you had this actually in production, you would be bundling this together. And I'm actually going to um, reference at the end of this some of the better ways to package this than what I've done. I've literally shown you the worst possible way to use Google Closure today. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see here. Open. OK, and if this works as expected, um, I had set a listener on this button, which is just a regular button. It's not a widget or anything. And this should take the already created um, widget and render it into the page. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I'm here all week. Um, 
Something has no method inherits. Oh, I guess I didn't. Um, oh, that's right. I didn't fix this. Okay. One more try. And if this doesn't work, I'm going to have to take it on a good faith test. Okay, so you notice it started at 27 there. I have it counting off from uh, the moment it was created, which was three seconds before that. Um, and it had already been counting because it existed in the background. And when we hit rendered is when it actually entered into the DOM. Um, I had a listener so that when you're mousing over it, it tells you how many seconds it has in milliseconds, and it's spitting that out at the bottom. Um, I'm going to wait a second because I also have it waiting for a change event that it dispatches on itself. And um, yep, dang, we missed it is the listener that we had on that. Putting that event out was one line um, on an existing Google library, which made it pretty easy as well. Um, and then we can dispose of it at the end. And we don't have to worry about any of those uh, events or objects that we've created in the meantime, because it takes care of it. This is a really simple example, but it was also really simple to create, which was the beauty of it. OK. Um, I'm going to skip this a moment. Except suffice to say that this was simple, but there's actually a better way to do um, really great widgets um, than what we've done here. If you wanted to have a widget that had multiple different representations, this only has one create DOM. You could theoretically hook it up to a series of different create DOMs for looking one way in one page, one way in another. Um, so how good was our deployment for this? It was actually pretty terrible. It was the uh, least optimal way to do this of all of them. Um, Oh, there we go. Um, every time we have the Google require in live code, it's just putting in script tags, which means more requests and requests and requests and requests on top of requests. So that's slow. It means that the code that you're pulling down is unminified, it's uncompiled, which is slow not just for the time to pull it down, the time to parse it, but also the time to execute it. So the ways to make it better um, than this example would have been instead of taking raw code, which has tons of requests, it's not minified, not optimized. What we could have done is bundle it. There's a script that comes with Google Closure that would have done this for us in uh, one line. We could have served it up. It'd still be a fairly large file, even for pretty simple things. Um, so if you were to minimize it and use the simple compilation from the Google Closure compiler, this would have put you in a better situation. Um, but if you're feeling particularly adventurous, you could use the Google Closure advanced compilation. And that'll give you code that looks something like this which can be fun to debug, I'll tell you. Um, but otherwise, it's really uh, a pleasure to work with in terms of speed of execution and um, the downloading. Um, so I think I'm just within time for my demonstration today. And I thank you all for your attention. Um, did we have any questions about Google Closure Library in general or about widgets in particular? I've spent most of my time working with the widgets library, um, but I've also done uh, a bit else. So I've got some experience over there. Uh, the question was if I'd done anything with mobile applications. Uh, no, I've not actually. For the particular uh, app that we do at CloudKick, I'm on the front end for our web app team, and we'd considered doing a mobile version of the site for a bit. But presently, we've got just hired on someone that's actually doing uh, native um, Android and iPhone apps for CloudKick. I think we actually have both already, but he's really improving them. So that's not the highest priority as far as the mobile platform is concerned. For the mobile platform, we're pursuing the native apps at the moment. Have, have you um, worked with it for mobile, or was it interesting? I have. I don't see any issues now, but I've been looking, obviously, things like Sencha and the other frameworks. Mm -hmm. Closure doesn't look like it has any legs like, native apps that you Right. Um, if you're talking, are you talking native in um, appearance? Uh, okay. So for um, appearance, I think the task you would have there is just to take the existing uh, widgets and write new renderers for them, which isn't entirely trivial. So um, yes, if you're looking for something that looks entirely like an iPhone app, you're probably looking at something like Sencha. Um, and if there aren't any more questions, uh, I thank you for your time and for your beer.